I'm going to do a little work while we're doing this. I hope you don't mind. Uh, Bob is here. I shall admit him. I think I got him. I think. Okay. Hello. Hello there. Sorry I'm late. Uh, we call the order. All patiently waiting for me. Bonnie, would you begin with a roll call, please? Sure. Okay, do we have Guy Rosenbaum? Here. And Dennis King? Here. Diana Pimlot, I believe is absent, although she may log on. She contacted me, I thought she was going to be out, but she might be able to join us at some point. John Barnett, and he said he was going to be a little bit late, so okay. hopefully he will be joining us. Suzanne Manheims? I'm here. Okay, Paul Burns. Here. And Bob Stone. Here. And our right. superintendent is here. Okay. Yes, and our special guest, Vince Adams, will be in yeah. <laughs> just a second. Uh, welcome all. And I just want to take a, a, a real brief moment to, to uh, talk about the importance of what we're doing today. Uh, I was going to take a couple of minutes and just mention my style of, of chairing a meeting, and I think I talked about that uh, last meeting as well, but I just, I don't like to take extra time unless it's something that, that needs the extra time, and I just want to let everybody know that if I'm moving too fast and you have more questions or want to discuss it more, do not hesitate to say, hey, Bob, let's slow down a little bit. Uh, I like to include everybody in the in the discussion, and I will cold call on somebody occasionally uh, if they haven't uh, contributed to the discussion. Not that you have to, but I think sometimes people will hold back a little bit, uh, maybe waiting for their turn uh, or waiting to be invited. And so I like to give everybody the opportunity to do that. So, uh, especially on heavy duty matters or weighty matters, I will I will go around the room and ask everybody to to chime in and give their feelings on something. If I will give everybody an opportunity to, to speak on it, but I do like to move briskly. And with that in mind, I would like to uh, uh, welcome our facilitator this evening. Uh, Vince Adams is a member of the Corvallis School Board. Uh, how many years, Vince? I was elected in 2013. Okay, all right. So. Uh, seven, eight years on the Corvallis School Board. Uh, before that, he he came from uh, Sysos Arch Rival, 20 miles to the south, but uh, from Reedsport, but that's all right, we're, we're all friends now. So uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about uh, our, our handbook and how to set up uh, some goal setting, I, I hope or understand. And you can. So hopefully, I'll just let him tell it. So please welcome Vince. Well, thanks, folks, for having me. Um, you know, let me uh, share my screen really quick. I can throw a slide up. So the, the way this is going to go, I'm going to I have a slide deck and then we're going to go through your handbook. I've gone through and read through it and you had some stuff that you wanted to discuss in there, but I pulled out some things uh, 
good stuff. And you have a couple things that I, I think you might want to take another look at. And then um, I'm going to go over um, uh, superintendent evaluation because it sounds like you folks are going to be, be starting that process. Um, and maybe with the new uh, COSA OSBA evaluation document. So I'm going to give you a sneak preview of that and what that process uh, can look like for you folks. And then if, uh, you know, if we, we have time, uh, we can talk about goal setting and the types of goals that you want to set. And so uh, we can do that right there at the end if that's uh, comfortable uh, for you folks. So that's kind of what it's going to look like. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, I used to work for OSU Extension. I'm actually new with OSBA. I just got hired in April, uh, right as we were going into the, pan into the pandemic. Um, you know, I've got this great office in Salem. It overlooks the Salem skyline. I can see the pioneer, the gold pioneer on the top of the Capitol Rotunda from my office, except that I've never worked in my office because I work remotely. So uh, I get to travel all over the state like this. So um, I'm looking forward to when the pandemic's over and we can meet face to face. And I really prefer that over <laughs> doing this, but uh, you know, we got to do what we can got to do. Um, so let me share my screen. So you got to have cover slide. Let me move your, hold on folks. I got to configure some windows here so I can see you and see uh, my slide previews and my notes and everything all at the same time. Well, there's the agenda. That's what I wanted right there. Now I can see you too. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover. Uh, roll the board, a uh, really brief. I mean, uh, you're a fairly experienced board. Um, you know, Bob shared that you have someone that's been on the board for, for a couple decades, it sounds like. So you have a lot of experience, but it's always good to go over the basics and hear those things over and over again, uh, making sure that we stay in our lane. Um, we're gonna take a pretty deep dive into your governance handbook and take a, a hard look at that. Um, and then, like I said, superintendent evaluation. So, but first um, I got, got a priming question. Um, how, are you, how are you folks holding up? And, uh, and I want you to reflect on what you're looking forward to as we're about to start school. Um, you know, what are you really looking for, uh, forward to this year? So if we can go around, I mean, I can tell you personally, boy, um, working distance like this um, was really hard initially. Um, I have a bunch of folks that I work with that um, some of them I've never met face to face. Um, and that has been a little tricky to do. Um, my kids are stir crazy. Um, we're a little worried about doing hybrid model here in Corvallis and how we're going to manage that. So, but fortunately, uh, our, you know, our families are healthy. And uh, so we're really thankful for that. And I'm thankful that I've got a really nice job that I enjoy doing. So, um, and uh, yeah, so why don't we go around and Talk about how you're holding up, what's going on, and what you're looking forward to. Well, I'll jump in first. Uh, you know, initially when we went into the shutdowns, it was a little, little uneasy. Uh, I took six weeks off from work, and work never stopped. By the time I got back, we were going 90 miles an hour, and it seems like we have still been continuing to go 90 miles an hour, but. Uh, you know, there's a lot of nervousness in my household, a little concern, uh, working in the public and everything, but we're getting through. And what you looking forward to school-wise? Uh, school-wise, I'm looking forward to getting kids back in touch with the uh, teachers as much as possible, because I realize that's, that's really key. Uh, sure, we can do all the stuff uh, online and have video conferences. But, you know, I don't have near as much education experience as a lot of the other folks here, but I know the importance of that one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one interaction. Uh, and kids, kids really crave the, you know, the physical touch as well, you know, holding hands, a little hug from a teacher or whatever. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I totally agree. 
Um, I know my kids are really looking forward to seeing their teachers. Yeah. Who wants to go next? I can. That's fine. Um, so I was uh, I was chairman of our board when all this came down. Um, and and I, I, I literally would wake up screaming some nights uh, trying to figure out what this meant and what it looked like for us going forward. But I'll tell you, as time's gone forward, uh, and as I kind of realize what I think we're seeing in our future, both from this disease and from what's going to be our financial situation in this state and locally, um, I, I, I think that our school district and the people in this town are in a really good position. I think we're going to find that this modified model of school is not bad and maybe is even for the best in a lot of respects. It's going to give parents a lot more interaction with their children than they've had in the past. And I think we've all discovered that the more the, the parents are involved in the children's education, the better the children do. Um, I think this is going to be a good thing. I think it's going to save us some money. I think it's going to probably prevent us from having to build expensive, larger schools um, going forward. And I'm hoping it's a model we can maintain going forward. I could be wrong. Um, and I'm open-minded to being wrong. But um, I, I think this is forcing us to embrace a lot of technology that the education system is quite frankly ignored and fought against for years. So I'm hopeful. I really appreciate your optimism. I, I, I think you, you know, change is always hard and, and you all know that, that uh, the education system has a lot of inertia. It's hard to, to turn that ship. So, you know, sometimes we need a kick in the pants to, to adopt new, new ideas, new ways of doing, getting things done. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. I think, yeah, what we're doing right now will probably create some fundamental changes in the way we deliver education going forward. Yeah, I agree. Who'd like to go next? Hey Vince, I'll go next. Um, just because I'm, I'm on the other side uh, from Guy, which is this isn't good for anybody. Uh, you know, these, you know, maybe the technology Maybe, in fact, I, I did hear from one of the administrators today that uh, the platform is a whole lot better than I thought it was going to be, where the teachers are going to be able to control that the kids actually just see them. Well, that's your best foot forward, and I think we're doing that, but we got to get those kids back into the, the classrooms as soon as possible. Personally, how, how are are we, how am I holding up during the pandemic? I think uh, just Suzanne and I are, are the two retired board members. Uh, so that said, uh, you know, it affects me differently. I, I go out and I'm, <laughs> I'm out in the woods and uh, so to speak, and it really hasn't bothered me. I, I call Fred Meyer, I pick up my groceries. I, you know, so I kind of live in a little area where it really hasn't affected me. Um, by the way, uh, Emma Carvalho's high graduate, so. Uh, hey, go Sparks. I, I go Sparks, that's right. So, um, yeah, but we need to get the kids back in. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. They need to be in, well, they have to have their keisters in those seats as soon as possible. There you, that's, that's me. Yeah, I, I, and I think the kids want to be back in school. Yeah, they were really hungry for that. Yeah. That time will come. Suzanne and I think Paul. Paul, if you would go first, I'd appreciate it. Uh, okay, Suzanne, just for you. <laughs> um, so how, how am I holding up uh, with the pandemic? Um, Pretty well, actually, um, work-wise, been doing the work I was supposed to be doing anyway because I'm outside all the time and um, that sort of thing. So 
Um, I was working remotely a lot from work anyway. Um, and uh, I'm not a terribly social person anyway, so um, I don't mind being alone. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we do we do pretty well as a as a close knit family. So um, looking forward to board work this year. Well, um, it's I'm looking forward to some changes that have been made in the in the district and seeing how how we rebound rebound and and maybe make our district stronger. I think having some of those changes in our uh, management admin will hopefully allow us to get past some stuff that's been been in the system for my 16 years that I've been here. So um, yeah, I hope we'd uh, we can make some gains. Sounds good. Yeah, you know, one of the things you know. You're not alone, but one of the things that I've noticed in the last couple months in the way in interacting with boards is that, you know, kind of the way you were talking, it's like boards are getting back to work. I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but it's not really a crisis anymore. Everybody's just rolling up their sleeves and getting back to the things that need to get done. And so I really appreciate your comments there. You know, it's getting into that yeoman's work. Suzanne, it looks like we picked up Diana. Well, I can talk a little bit. Um, you know, my husband and I are old and we have all of those underlying conditions that they say people die from. So we've been pretty um, secluded and isolated and careful about our social contacts. And um, sometimes that's okay. And sometimes I really yearn to get out, you know, get a little stir crazy. Um, the the hopes for school is that um, while I can see, you know, some really neat evolutions that are happening in terms of the advancement of technology and the way teachers are learning different ways to teach and get across to students, um, I'm kind of hopeful that we will, well, we'll, like with any change, you know, you take the best and leave the rest, because I think there are certainly positive things to come out of this uh, this shift in the educational model and things that we'll want to keep doing this way. But then I also really, really worry about the lack of social relationships amongst kids, about the lack of, um, you know, school is a safe haven for many of our kids. There are a lot of needs that they have that are met by school staff and their interactions with the teachers and the aides and the bus drivers and all that. And so I really would like that um, kind of safety net, emotional safety net to be back in place for students as soon as we can get it there. And I know we're trying to do that through the delivery of meals and things, but it's definitely high on my list of concerns that, that kids are out there with not enough support, not enough supervision, um, not enough tender loving care, all that. So that's where I'm at. So I'm looking forward to moving forward and seeing what we come up with. Well, Suzanne, thank you for surfacing that. You know, you know, I know that, you know, districts all over the state are working really hard to try and meet the needs of kids. And, uh, but I have a firm believer in the power of the schoolhouse and having how that can just change the context for a kiddo, uh, particularly a kiddo that may be coming from a situation where they're struggling. Um, and so, and that's hard to do in a virtual environment. It's hard to create that in a virtual environment. And I know our educators are really trying, doing their very best to make that happen, but you know, trying to get care and connection uh, for our kids. Diana, are you there for us? There she is. Can you hear me okay? Here you good. I am um, Diana Pimlot, and I am currently at work. <laughs> we have um, we have a, a high acuity workload today, so I am still here, kind of managing that. And so my ability to participate tonight may be um, interrupted at times, but I'll do my best. So I didn't hear the question going in, but I but I have a um, I've been listening, so I have a, a good understanding of what you're asking for. How am I holding up um, 
uh, to the pandemic and um, and all that all that the pandemic brings. Because I am the director of pharmacy services, uh, director of outpatient infusion services, and the patient safety officer here at Peace Harbor, um, I think I feel it, I see it, I realize it maybe uh, more than some on the board um, do from a much different perspective. Um, I'm aware of, um, you know, what this, what COVID-19 brings to a family when it is realized. Um, I'm aware of the, um, the key importance of our, of keeping our, um, of social distancing, of wearing the mask, of using all the preventative um, measures to ensure that we're not spreading this disease. At the same time, I wear a mask 12 to 15 hours a day. And let me tell you, it's miserable. Um, I, you know, I'm, my temperature is taken every day, once or twice. I'm washing my hands until they're almost raw. We have to six seat, uh, seat, be seated six feet apart, but yet our, our workspaces are, you know, very, very small. So it's very difficult to preserve social distancing. Um, but, but we're doing it and we're doing it um, to protect our patients and our community. So um, it's exhausting. Um, I am a, the primary uh, caregiver for our I'm sorry, the primary um, support for our household as well. We have our grandson who is living with us and he is going to be a freshman in high school this year. So um, he's the only child at home. And, and let me tell you that, um, that this, this past six months have been very difficult for him and for other kids um, in our community. Um, the lack of socialization is really has significant impacts for these kids. And I worry about them. Um, so Suzanne's right on target. You know, it, I want the kids in school. I want them there as, as quickly as we can. But at the same time, I'm here to tell you that this thing is real. We need to keep them safe. We need to keep their families safe and try to prevent the spread. So everything we can do to get them there. Anything um, you're looking, anything you're looking forward to this school year? For the school year itself? Yeah. Well, I will tell you that we've made the very difficult decision of putting Hunter, um, taking him from the, the school, say it's the school district and put him in a private online program until we can, until we have this, these issues settled. He wants to come back to school. He wants to be there. Um, but he is home by himself for the biggest part of the day. And we really need a program that is sound, structured, proven, and that I can um, um, be assured that he is receiving the, the proper structure and guidance to get through. And so we have moved them. It's going to be new for us. It's it's going to be challenging for us this school year. In terms of what we're looking for, forward to about um, board work this year, you know, I, I think I agree. Um, I have to agree with Paul in that I think some of the administrative changes are, are really going to serve to just make this, um, this school district stronger and, um, and more progressive and really working to ensure that our kids are, are, um, are receiving the best, um, the best education that we can provide them. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for, for you know, being vulnerable and talking about the, the hard things you're having to do and hard choice to, to move your kiddo. I would hate to have to think about that. Those are hard things. So thank you all for what you shared. That's important. It's important to, to share that we're all struggling, that we're all in this together and uh, yeah, and doing the best we can. So let's dive in. Um, so the whole purpose of this slide uh, is to just let you know that the work that you're doing 
uh, this afternoon and this evening uh, matters. Um, starting back in the 2000s with the Lighthouse Project in Iowa, uh, there's been research done at University of Montana that validated Lighthouse, um, just showing that the work, the efficacy of school boards has an impact on student outcomes. So don't think that this is time wasted. This is time well spent because what you do matters to student outcomes. So what you bring, your knowledge, the values, the beliefs that you bring into the, the boardroom and the way that you behave, you know, and as you do your board work has an impact on the district uh, practices, the way folks, your leadership team does their work and the overall organ organizational culture. So the board sets the tone for the organization. And that finds its way into classrooms and that's where the rubber meets the road. And I mean, we're all aiming at student achievement. We want to improve student outcomes over time. And so the work that you're doing here where you're just taking a step back, you're looking at your own practices, you're looking at your governance documents and uh, looking at how you're holding your, your one employee accountable and communicating your expectations that is very, very important work. So thank you for taking the time and having me here to, to support you in doing that. Um, like I said, this is a workshop. This is not a lecture. So feel free if you have questions or comments or if there's something relevant to the work that you folks are doing or there's an issue that, that you wanna elevate in this conversation, feel free to interrupt me. Um, this is a small group. Feel free to turn your, turn your mics on. Um, so yeah, feel free to interrupt because I used to be an extension and every, every talk is a workshop. So this is the way I roll. So if you take nothing else away from what our session tonight, this is your most important thing that you must do. There's five, five roles of the board, and this is the most, probably the most important one. Uh, you need to set clear expectations for your chief administrator. You need to set a focus for improving student instruction. Um, you need to develop policies that, that communicate your expectations. Um, you know, you need to set your targets for where, what you want improved and by what time period. And you need to establish a, you know, a district-wide understanding and commitment to uh, student achievement goals. Um, you know, we, we always want to be using evidence-based approaches in the work that we do. And so these are all things that you should be thinking about as you're setting expectations and thinking about those things as you're, as you're thinking about goals. It sounds like um, this board needs, wants to be doing some goal setting. So uh, keep some paper handy next to you as we go through this, jotting things down. I'm going to zip through these pretty quickly because... Um, you know, you're an experienced board and I don't need to teach you basic roles and responsibilities again uh, in, in detail. You already know a lot of this. The other, you know, the next thing that you need to be doing is learning as, as, as a team. Um, you know, we hear, hear about PLCs, uh, professional learning communities. Well, this board is a professional learning community. You are a PLC uh, in conjunction with your superintendent. And so you need, that's the work that you're doing tonight. Um, coming together and just sharpening the blade, getting better at what you do. This is another key role for the board. Um, it's incumbent on you to create those, those conditions for success. So I would just want to pause here. And as you think about the work that you, that you do, what does this, what does this statement mean? Creating the conditions uh, for success. What does that mean to you as board members? For Paul Burns here. So I guess given the administration, the support and the tools they need to do the, to be able to teach the kids to the best of their ability. Yeah, absolutely. What now? When you say tools, what do you mean by tools? Uh, well, um, approving the the budget that's needed, um, 
you know, supporting um, professional development, um, um, uh, we can kind of whatever else, you know, the administration lets us know that's really critical for, for being able to teach the kids. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, you have to allocate resources based on the priorities that you identify. No, absolutely. What else comes to mind when we're talking about conditions for success? I think another, oh, this is Suzanne. I think another condition for success would be helping to build that bridge between the community and the community expectations of its young people and what's happening in the schools, you know, so that we're working on student achievement of success. And we're also um, creating conditions and students that the community is happy and proud of and feels like supporting. Absolutely. I mean, one of the key areas around what you're talking about, that community engagement piece, that's actually another role of the board. But in this, in this context, I think one of the most important aspects of creating conditions for success is celebrating that success. I mean, you, you, have, you are the cheerleaders for your district. If the board is unhappy with the district, the community is going to be unhappy with the district. So you need to celebrate the successes of your superintendent and his staff. So absolutely. Miss Diana, if I could just offer. Yeah. I think it is, um, you know, to be, what is success, right? We want every one of our kids to come out of school with the education that they need, that child needs to be successful as an adult. And really, to make that happen, we do need the collaboration of the community. And we need to be asking the right questions and be willing to turn around and collaborate with the community to ensure that we're providing these kids with what is really needed, what they want, what, what they need to be successful. Um, and we have to start that by asking the right questions of the community and really um, earn their, um, their willingness to participate with us in growing a, great, growing a great program. So we need to be more open, I think, to community involvement and participation. You know, Diane, you, you really, you, you're saying something that's really important. The reality is that um, the way we do education now, um, school districts can't educate kiddos on their own. We just are not adequately resourced uh, to do that. So we have to do it in partnership with you know, other entities in our, in our community. So you probably have nonprofits that you partner with. You probably have some after school programs things like that. And so you're absolutely right. You need to have the community, not just for guidance, you're absolutely right, but also just to literally operationalize a, a complete education for our kiddos. Any other thoughts? You know, some of the other things, you know, conditions for success might be structural. You know, you need to have the right leadership teams in place and you can collaborate with your with your superintendent to have those things in place. We talked about real allocating resources and going back to that, you know, staff need time and space to do work. And again, you know, that's that's a condition that you need to set priorities to ensure that staff has the time and space um, and resources to do that. Thanks for all those responses. Holding the system accountable. It's pretty obvious. Uh, we have a bunch of data up here, but uh, that's not the only way. Um, you know, this is a lot of quantitative, or representing quantitative information, but um, student achievement isn't the only measure of a student's experience in school. And it's not the only way that they're gonna be successful. Um, we hear from our business communities that kids are being graduated without the human skills they need to be successful in the workplace. And they need to have an opportunity to learn those skills. That's not something you can really measure with, uh, you know, numerically, that's really a subjective measure. Um, and, you know, we hear about mental health. So there's these qualitative metrics. So you, this board 
any board needs to identify what are those key measures. You can't track all the measures. That's the job of your superintendent to get down in the weeds, to really look at the full suite of metrics. But what are those key metrics that this board is going to need to look at going forward so that you're re reaching your goals? And then the last role of the board is to create that public will to succeed. This is what you were talking about, Diana. Um, you know, engaging the community, celebrating success, communicating the goals that, that the board and the district are sharing, uh, communicating progress uh, to the community, the, uh, the district's progress to those goals. Um, you know, engaging the community to ensure that partners are focused on, on helping the district meet, meet goals. And, uh, you know, just continuously um, building a foundation for the moral imperative for uh, the board to govern the, the school district and to continue improve, continuous improvement for the school district. So um, this is a, well, we call it the focus framework and it's, it has the five roles of the board. And coincidentally, the five roles of the board actually is embedded in your, in your governance document. And I, I've crosswalked that. So we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a little bit. So these are ideas that shouldn't be, you know, completely out of the blue. You're already doing these things. I'm just reinforcing them. So I don't know if I have animation. I don't have animation, but this is a, a great tool for you to use and I can share it with the board secretary and, and, you know, board, if you think this is something that would be useful for you to focus your attention and effort, um, then please do take it up because these are the five roles that evidence shows that is shown empirically to impact uh, student outcomes. So nice tool here. So this is probably my favorite slide in, in the talks that I do. And this is, you know, we've all seen this before. This is a chart of the roles of the board versus the roles of the superintendent. Um, and we see, you know, up above, you know, the board can advocate, it sets the goals, the high level goals. You know, of course you take up policies and I could put a, put a bunch of other functions up in here, but you get the idea, that's your area. And then down below we have the superintendent and he, he's in charge of all the operations. He's dealing with personnel, you know, and he has to come up with his own uh, administrative rules. He's got to navigate all the regulations for running the district. Now you notice the, the red arrows, the superintendent can, can step into the board's lane. So you can think about these as lanes on a highway. The, the superintendent can step in his lane and support the board in the work that you do. Um, it's the, really the only way that you can get the information you need to be making informed decisions that needs to come from your superintendent. And your superintendent is part of, you know, is a team member, is a part of the leadership team, the board and superintendent together. But the arrows don't go the other way. And it's really important that the board has uh, respect and trust for the superintendent to get the work done. Now, when we encounter times that can be confusing, where uh, requirements, you know, the situation is dynamic, maybe something like this pandemic, or if you have a controversial issue um, where emotions are running high or it's a confusing situation, things can get muddy. And we don't know exactly where we stand. And so that's why going over the these uh, board roles and responsibilities and the superintendent's roles and responsibilities is so important. It needs to be a rhythmic practice that you're doing every year, maybe multiple times a year. And in fact, it's embedded in the superintendent evaluation process. So that we'll talk about that a little bit later. So it's important that we develop these skills and be fully conversant and know where our lane is at, or where it's not, because we don't, when, when, times are difficult, that's when trust and respect gets eroded between the board and the superintendent. And we can't have that happen because remember what you do, your board practices have an, an impact on student outcomes. And we wanna make sure that we're being the, the best board members that we can be. So 
using a ship as a metaphor for the school district, um, the superintendent is in charge of, of the ship. He's, he is the captain of the ship. He's the one that, that steers it. Um, he's in charge of, of all the crew from, uh, you know, the, the first mate all the way down to, you know, well, you know, custodians or your, your campus stewards or everyone, food service, all of that. That's all within the realm of the superintendent. He's the guy that drives the ship. The board is on the governance side. You get to commission the trip. You get to choose the destination. You get to say, superintendent, we wanna go over here. We wanna to go to the, the land of student success paradise. We wanna to go to that island. And you can even say, we wanna take a couple turns here and you can define to a certain degree how you're gonna get there. But it's going to be it's going to be the captain that has to drive the ship to get there. Um, so this is the distinction, the really important one that, that you need to understand. Now, when we think about governance, we you know in the United States we think about it in three ways. The, go back to civics back in high school. We think about it: the legislative capacity, judicial capacity, and the executive capacities. And the board actually has all three of these. Um, you, it's one of the unique things about school boards is that we get to exercise all three of these um, from time to time. So the first one is, of course, legislative. It's the one that we're most familiar with and comfortable with. You know, we're used to adopting policies, developing policies and adopting policies. Uh, sometimes we get to negotiate contracts. Uh, your your board, you have board members that sit in in your uh, collective bargaining agreements. Uh, you definitely are developing goals. That's how you choose the destination that your ship is going to go to. Is you set the goals. So when we're at, when we're doing things that are actions that are rooted in a process, that's when we're using our legislative capacity as board members. So judicial, you know, this is a, one of the rare things. It doesn't happen very often, thankfully. Um, but the board's role is to hear cases on appeal very rarely. And hopefully it hasn't happened to this board, uh, at least in recent years, where the board actually has, there's a complaint on the board. Usually it's something uh, much lower in the, in the organization that gets appealed upward and it finds its way to the school board. Um, this is a time for the board to really pause and take its time because we don't get a lot of practice. Uh, we're not judges where we're sitting and hearing cases day after day. We don't get a lot of education in navigating judicial situations. So this is an important place where you need to take your time in, and you know ensure that your superintendent has the support that you need to consider the case appropriately. And that usually means having counsel available to you, um, you know, both for uh, investigation, um, explaining it to the board, and then maybe having a hearings officer as well to guide the board in making those decisions. Um, this is a situation where the board can actually expose the district or itself uh, to liability. So it's definitely a time to, to take your time and be careful and do your due diligence. And then uh, executive capacity. Um, you know, we, we adopt policies that the, that the uh, superintendent brings to us. Uh, we approve contracts sometime. Uh, so, uh, you'll act as your local contracting authority if you're doing bonding work, uh, that sort of thing. Um, of course, you'll adopt goals. Um, if your superintendent has, a, has developed a strategic plan, the board will approve that. So it's really that final check off. You're just, it's almost, it's really an oversight capacity. You're making sure that all the ducks are in a row, everything looks good and you check off on it. And so, I mean, this is just a comparison of, you know, uh, high level functions here. Uh, this should, should be all repeat for you. Uh, you know, the board hires the superintendent and the superintendent is the only employee of the board and the superintendent hires all the staff for the organization. 
of the board approves contracts, but the superintendent is tasked with handling all the employee relations. So the superintendent does all the HR work. Uh, the board sets the vision and goals. You get to choose the destination for the voyage, but the superintendent has to turn that, has to steer the ship to get you there. So the superintendent has to turn those goals into action. Um, the board adopts policies. Uh, the superintendent deals with regulations. So you have board policies and you have administrative regulations. The board sets the budget, but the superintendent and his team are, are the ones who plan the expenditures. Suzanne, I am happy to turn, to give you this slide deck. So I'm ha I will happily turn this into a PDF and send it off to you. Um, this is all customized. You're gonna see your own policies in here. So I'm, this is customized to you. And the board, you know, this is probably your, one of your most important oversight roles is monitoring progress. And the superintendent needs to provide you with those key indicators that you're gonna track to, so you can follow the, the district's uh, progress. Oh, okay, so I get to stop and take a breath and ask for questions. Is all this, any, any of this new or disruptive or? Good, okay, so I wanna get, I wanna move on then, um, you know, from the board overall to our individual behavior. And we're gonna get into a little, about, little bit of policy here. So individual board, the behavior of individual board members is, is governed under policy BBAA and you have one of those. And here it is. Um, and there's more here than meets the eye. Um, and you should be familiar with this policy. Um, so it, the important things to take away is that as individuals, as individual board members, we have no authority. Uh, we have no official, uh, official power as individual board directors. Um, authority only comes from the board acting as a convened body, as you are right now, as the, the Sayus Law School District Board, you now have power to take action. So item number four under BBAA, and this is you know, a crucially important piece, is that individual board members do not direct the superintendent. And we never, have the capacity, we don't have the authority to intervene in district operations. Moreover, when we do, or if we try to, it breaks the trust and respect of the superintendent. And you might be picking up, I keep saying those terms over and over. That's how we get work done. That's how we work together with our superintendent is by building, building trust and respect with our administrator. So this is your policy BBFF. This is, um, you, you have a really nice robust, um, you know, policy BBF. Um, in, I forget how many th actual items in here. Sometimes districts have a fairly short uh, standards of conduct. You have lots of standards of conduct. And this is another, another policy that you should take a look at. And these are the rules that you are setting for yourself. Um, and there is only one authority for enforcing this policy, and that is you. You need to hold each other accountable to this policy. Um, and you would do that in a, in a board meeting, or if you can also do it in a private conversation. But yeah, no one else is going to hold you accountable. There is no author other authority. You have to do it yourself, except every four years when, you, when the voters get to, get to vote. So board staff communications. So this is an area where uh, board members uh, often struggle. Um, you know, we got, we ran for school board because we wanted to help. There's, you, we are called to do this work. Um, you know, and you know, board members, particularly young board members don't always understand all the rules and uh, and we don't always understand what the impact can be if we do it, do you know, our internal communications wrong or we break the rules. So it's important that we, you know, 
brush up on our policies and uh, do our communications with skill. So uh, this is your policy uh, for board staff communications, policy BG. The take home here is that all communication will be conducted through the superintendent. That's what this policy says. So that if you're gonna communicate with the district, um, either sending information down or getting information out of the district, it needs to go through your superintendent. You have to respect that conduit. Um, and it's codified here in policy BG. That also talks about school visits. Um, and uh, when we go to schools, it's always important there are official school visits, and it's interesting that in policy, you, you, your policy makes a distinction between official school visits and informal visits. Um, and your policy says that um, official visits need to be approved by the board and informal visits, it's a little more loosey-goosey. But whenever we are in a school in our district, um, we are there to learn. We are there as students of our staff, and I would say also students of our students. It's an opportunity to learn uh, from what's going on in the school. It is never an inspection, and it's never a time to be fishing for problems. Um, if, if there are problems, if problems do come up, you know, we're not, it's important that we don't uh, discuss that with staff directly. We need to bring that back to our superintendent. It's the superintendent's job to do that, um, to figure out what those problems are and tease them out. It's not the job of a, you know, a board member to do that. So um, email is really what this is getting to, um, board communications. So what's an individual? And so I'm gonna, take a pause here and I'm just going to ask um, board members, um, how do you handle your email? Well, I, Paul Burns, I can uh, say on that some. So um, we, we know, you know, we're not to have communications back and forth between board members. So typically stuff is, is moving out to board members, not between board members. Uh, this, this Bob here, I, I'm in agreement with, with Paul that the understanding is that if we have questions of what's going on, it, it goes to the staff, the superintendent, uh, or Bonnie, or usually both. Um, it's okay to have communication from one board member to another, but only from the line of, you know, something simple, not deliberative or anything like that. Uh, sometimes a board member will send something out to all board members and copy the superintendent on it uh, just to get the same information to everybody. And everybody, I believe, understands that they're not to reply all. Uh, you know, if we get a question about a matter from the superintendent that he sent to everybody, we just respond to the superintendent and, and keep that communication ba basically one way from the superintendent to the board. Uh, because any deliberation we do, we need to do as a public body in a public setting. So this is Guy Rosenbaum. It's a public document. Yeah, you can't break open meetings laws, most definitely. You can't have a quorum discussing via email, but it's a public document. So anything you say in your email, <clears throat> even if it's going to a private individual from your, your school email because you're a public person, makes it a public document and makes it attainable via a FOIA request. And you need to treat it as such. You got to be really careful what you say because you might as well be saying it on the street corner. Yep. Any other ideas in there? I'm hearing all good stuff. This is good. So yeah, what you said, you summed it up really well. And uh, fortunately, it's all in, it's all in your policy. You, you just articulated it. Um, 
you know, the board can only act in, when convened as a body in a public meeting. Um, you know, you're absolutely right, Bob. Um, and only procedural communication is allowed outside of public meetings. Content is never allowed. Um, and so let's see. Yeah, so here it is. Item two under your policy BD. Um, email among board members is limited to disseminating information. It is always good for board members to be sharing articles with each other. That's part of that learning together as a team. Totally appropriate. You should do that. But uh, we don't have discourse while we're doing that. You know, and like you said, messages not involving deliberation, debate, or decision making. Absolutely. And one thing that I do like about your BD that I and that I may steal for my own board is um, you specify, you'll see uh, email may contain, and it goes on to list what what um, your emails can contain. It gives suggestions. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so I may I may steal that. So good job on email. So questions, and this is not a prompt for me to ask if you have questions. It's what if you have questions and you wanna know something in between board meetings, uh, what do you do? Where do you go? And um, Bob, I think you were the one that said this, you know, it really depends, but it's gonna be, you know, if it's a procedural uh, piece, you know, what's gonna happen in the meeting? How are we gonna handle this? particular agenda item, that's probably going to go to the, go to the board chair because your board chair is facilitating the meeting. Um, but if it's information about the district, that needs to go to the superintendent and you should probably CC your board, board secretary along with it because your superintendent is a busy guy and it's always good to have your uh, board secretary having situational awareness about what's going on with the board and what, you know, what board members are thinking. So any questions about that? Good. All right. So um, BCD uh, talks about uh, just your, the board's relationship with the superintendent and your policy, like uh, virtually any other policy for a district in the state of Oregon, you know, your superintendent is the chief executive. The superintendent is entrusted with the authority for all operations. Um, um, one thing that, um, one thing that I, I didn't see in this policy that I've seen elsewhere in other districts policies is, um, you know, that it's essential for the board as a unified body, uh, to make its expectations and priorities clear. And, um, and that the super board give the superintendent feedback, uh, on progress in, you know, either having regular check-ins or um, and an evaluation. So that's something that you may want to look at uh, with policy BCD is adding um, just that that statement that the board needs to make its expectations clear to the superintendent and that you're going to have these check-ins um, and an evaluation of the of the superintendent. So this last slide is about about leadership. Um, each of you is a leader and each of you can lead the board on a, on a particular issue. Um, but, you know, oftentimes when we, we have something that we've noticed or that we're passionate about, um, we don't always know how to get that done. How do you advance an agenda with the, with the board? And so one of the first things you got to do is start, um, having hard conversations, um, Get out of the deep, out of the shallow end, and get into the deep end, and start having um, those harder conversations that need to happen. Uh, you need to build trust and understanding amongst your board members. Um, you all have different views. You have different backgrounds, different experiences, different skill sets, and so you need to have those conversations to start building that trust. Um, you're doing it right now. Always learn together as a team. You know, you go together. Remember, as individual board members, we don't have any authority. You have to bring your board with you if you want to advance an agenda. Um, you want to seek common understanding with your fellow board members. 
you need to focus yourselves. I mean, the reality, the reality is, is that school boards really don't get very much time together. Um, so you need to prioritize your time. Well, my, in my notes, I see prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Um, your resources are limited. So focus on the things that are important to this board and, and set that as your, as your priorities. Um, ultimately, you got to do something. So you, you need to create those vehicles for action. You're going to need to adopt a policy. You may need to shift resources around. You may need to have the superintendent develop a program. It's going to be something. You may need to take up a resolution. Whatever it is, you're going to need to do something to create change. And then, as with anything, you need to track your progress towards your goals. So if you're going to do something, figure out, how, figure out what success looks like for your board and then measure your progress to that goal. So I'm looking at the time. This is my transition slide. Well, I want to stop and go back. Are there any questions about this? Anything that chafes you about it, any gripes or complaints, that's okay too. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and transition. Um, it's 5.02. You've been sitting there staring at a screen, listening to me yak at you. Do we want, uh, does the board want to take a, a break, a five or 10 minute break? Or do you, would you like to press on? Because the next next thing we're going to do is we're going to get into your governance handbook. I, I would like a break. Five minute break. So I have 503. We'll go ahead and reconvene at 508.
Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Hey, so I saw Paul's chat. Are we going to take a dinner break later or? You're muted. Yeah. There we go. Uh, oh, well, I think that's, I think Paul is eating right now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I suppose we could discuss that, uh, with Vince, if we want to take a, a break for a dinner, I, I was going to go along the lines of what Paul did. I've got something to eat coming here pretty quick. I mean, I can probably, get, I can probably get the rest of this in probably about an hour. My my husband's making dinner, you know. So, but I'm fine to just kind of eat as we go and turn off my video when when I I'm ready to eat. However well, it works, that's fine for me. Whatever is most comfortable for you folks. Yeah. And I think I think I heard Vince say something along the lines of maybe another hour for him. So. Yeah. And then is do you have something planned after that? <laughs> no, no. Okay, I'm okay to wait then until uh, Mr. Adams is finished, and then because I, nobody's bringing my meal to me, uh, I have to go fix and then eat it. So that's fine. I, I am spoiled. It's true, a princess. <laughs> so if Paul's eating, uh, Diana, we're not sure. She's she's having to work and be in a board meeting at the same time. Do we know what's is John there? John, are you there for us? Oh, John. Yep, I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. So it sounds like we have everybody. So are we we're good to are we good to proceed? I, I'm right. I yeah. Okay, so um what I have up in front of me, uh, you should be able to you should be seeing a word document. It's your um it's your uh governance handbook. Um is everybody seeing that okay? I just want to confirm that I'm sharing and that's working. And you can read it okay. That's the other piece to this. So, um, you know, just to, uh, from the outset, you've heard me talk about building trust and respect with your superintendent and working as a team. I just really appreciated that the first sentence in your, in your governance document, um, it says, in in a school district, the board and superintendent work together as a governance team. It just, it's just a great way to start, start your document. So, um, yeah, I, in just in this, in that same vein, uh, you know, you notice that it's going back to that comment I made in, in one of the opening slides, your behavior sets the tone for the organization. And again, I appreciate you lifting out this, this piece. We are not a distraction to the district or, or community or the community uh, that, you know, you're committing in this document to work together. Um, and I like this, this turn of phrase as a catalyst for the focused efforts of employees and the community. So, just a really good language that um, really that you should aspire to um, all the time. So this is all all good things. I kind of color coded it. Now, you know, I talked about the five roles of the board at the you know we were talking basic roles and responsibilities. Five roles of the board fulfilling the five responsibilities here. And what you have here is we set the direction, you establish the structure, provide support, ensure accountability, and act as community leaders. Um, that just crosswalks perfectly, on, you know, on into our language, you know, that that we use here at OSBA. You know, we set the direction. You set clear expectations, creating conditions for success. Uh, you know, providing support, learning together as a team is. Even, you know, when you're listening to your staff, your superintendent and staff, you are providing support to them. Of course, accountability and building that community well, being those community leaders. So I was really pleased to see this and see this in your guiding document, um, how you as a board are gonna govern. So um, really good stuff.
So um, I want to stop here at no surprises. And I just want to ask, why is that important? Why, why does this need to be in, in your document? Well, Bob here, a lot of what we do is, de is dependent on that open communication. And you can, if, you have, if, if a, somebody has a particular agenda that they want to accomplish, uh, and I've seen it happen in other organizations before, sometimes they won't say anything about that objective until the last second, and then we'll spring it on people. And it just does not, it does not promote a healthy conversation. Uh, sometimes people will go, oh, this is the first I've heard of it, but I want to go along. So I'm okay. I'll, I'll grant you this and I'll agree to it at this time, but it may not be for the best interest of, of the district. Yeah, exactly. It, it breaks trust. I mean, if you, if you're, if you're lying in wait for somebody and then you jump them in a public meeting, uh, whether that's a board member or your superintendent, you know, that's just going to break trust with that individual. Um, and it's just, if you have an issue, if there is an issue or a problem that needs to be addressed as a board, you, can, you folks need to come together collaboratively to work together to fix that or address that problem or work with your superintendent to address that problem. So yeah, it breaks trust. The other thing about that is that if you spring something on your, on, uh, your superintendent or his staff, you're not getting them at their best. Um, you're not going to get the best response out of them. They haven't had time to necessarily think about that. And uh, as a board, you always want to get the best performance out of your staff. Um, so yeah, no surprises is, is a really good rule to have. I was really happy to, to see it here. Um, you know, right along with this is, you know, being you know, being collaborative and working together. And I just want to, I want to, again, I want to pause and ask, and, and I think I want to hear from everyone on the board. What does this mean to you, being collaborative? Well, to me, it means that we don't come with a set opinion about how we want it to be and then refuse to listen to one another, you know, that we come with our own ideas and understanding, you know, but then we listen to what everybody else says. And so that the decisions that are arrived at are a collective decision, not based on just the will of one person. Sometimes, you know, what the person, um, you know, there might be one person who has a really good idea and everybody says, yeah, 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 you know, but um, that doesn't always have to be that way. And it's just a respectful way to attend to the process. Thanks for that. You know, coming open-minded and being open-minded. Yeah, exactly. That's why we have boards. That's why in society, we, we have boards because I, one individual doesn't have all the knowledge that we need. So, you know, having multiple views helps us round out our collective knowledge as we, we grapple with things. Other thoughts? No, there's been lots of times over the years I came to a board meeting with thought I had my ideas of the, you know, of something that I saw on the agenda and I had my opinion on it and thought this is, you know, I, this is how I felt about it. And then I listened to the other board members and realized um, some really intelligent people on that board on this board and I was incredibly wrong. And my idea by the time we got to it, I had completely changed it because I'd heard six other perspectives. And so it comes back to that open-mindedness again and realizing that um, most of the time I am definitely not the smartest man in the room and I'm really you know, willing to listen to other people's opinions and be open-minded to it, so. Blind spots, that's what we call that. And of course, John, I see that you're with Coldwell Banker, so. I mean, you do you have no? That's a that's a real estate firm. Yes, it is. Yeah. So you don't have a for whatever reason. I got it in my head that you you were from a bank. Uh, in, in a previous life, yes, but not now. No, yeah. yeah. So yeah, covering your blind spots. Other thoughts. What does collaborative mean to you, particularly when you're grappling with a hard issue?
for typically all when um Go ahead, when Diana. I when I'm entering into a, uh, a situation in which collaboration is intent, come prepared. So you understand the material. You've had some time to consider, um, and you're willing to provide um, feedback, constructive at all, at all times, if possible. And you're really looking for that win-win. Always coming together with a shared goal. Yeah, Diana, I really appreciate that. Yeah, having a shared goal, you know, and it's easy on a school board because we're focused on kids all the time. So it's it's easy for us to stay focused or easier than maybe other, other boards. We're talking about bank boards or nonprofit boards, but with school boards, it's pretty easy to stay focused on kiddos. But I really appreciate your comment about becoming prepared. You know, not only just reading the packet and being knowledgeable, but um, being prepared to bring your best, um, making sure that you're rested, you know, and for us folks that that are still in our careers, that can be challenging. And I, I remember, I can remember a, a meeting last year when I was just, I was short on sleep and was in a, in a board meeting. And I remember you know, not being my best. I didn't bring my best to that meeting. So yeah, it's it's not just reading the packet. It's, you know, being your best self. Make sure you've had a, a decent meal and, and you're ready to do the work. Other thoughts? So Paul Burns here. Um, you know, when we, when we make decisions, um, you know, it has to be as a board, we have has to be uh, something that we're all uh, willing to, to uh, take out into public and support that, you know, that's one of our ways of, of operating as a board and, and to do that, you got to be able to, to give your, give your opinions and uh, feel like you're, it's, there's enough trust in the in the board that you can do that and even if uh you know you're outvoted you know six to one or whatever you know you still had your opportunity to talk and and uh um, say what you need to say and then you'll support that going on well said paul i mean uh we have all i mean if you serve on a board for any amount of time sooner or later you're going to be in the minority on a vote and uh one of the things that being on a board is you have to trust or you have to be able to support the board. And, uh, you know, and it's, it shows up later in your document, but I mean, if you don't, if you can't say anything nice and don't say anything at all, I mean, if you, if you can't support, or if you're really against the, the position of the board, then you just got to hold your tongue and trust the democratic process. Cause that's what you're doing. So thanks for that, Paul. We have a couple more people. Any other thoughts here? Well, I'll jump in here. Uh, I think everybody else that has talked about it uh, has hit the high points of collaboration, but I just uh, wanted to chime in. I really appreciated what Diana said about feedback. Uh, usually from me, from my perspective, collaborative is everybody contributing their, their thought, uh, their expertise on it, but uh, I haven't really stopped to think about you know, listening to that feedback uh, and taking time to listen to that collaboration. So uh, uh, it is, it, it's definitely two way because it's not just me saying what I think, but it's also me listening to what others think. Yeah, having a conversation. Other thoughts? I, I wasn't keeping track of who's spoken, so I'm, I'm not being, I'm not doing my due diligence here. So are you, are you needing everybody to chime in I'm, on that? I was kind of hoping to have everybody chime in. This is a pretty oh, important piece. Sure. So I, um, one thing that Suzanne had mentioned, and, uh, and I think she actually changed it a little bit, but uh, about coming on issues, coming with a, you know, an opinion. I usually always have an opinion when I look at what's coming up. 
uh, it, the collaboration part is then when you are uh, debating that. And, and yes, you absolutely are listening to that feedback from other people, other points of view. And that's what ultimately uh, boils it down to, as, as uh, John had said, <laughs> changing your mind or not, or, or modifying it. And so that's the whole collaborative process. Yeah. How about you, Andrew? We, we haven't heard from you at all in, the, in this session. What do you think about collaborating with your board? Well, I think it's a good idea. And, I, and again, um, I know OSBA does some uh, collaborative leadership development training. I think mm -hmm. it's a good workshop for down the road. Because, um, again, it, I think when you talk about collaborative leadership, you're really talking about th three pieces. Um, again, first being you know, shared input and shared vision, but then uh, a shared duty of implementation and then a shared responsibility of review. Um, again, I think we, we've always done a real good job of uh, step one. Uh, step two is a little shaky and sometimes uh, we don't make it to step three. Um, and again, that I think that's more, uh, that, well, that's human beings, not just, schools. So again, it, it's getting to that point where um, you're, you're moving through that process. And again, shared implementation uh, is, is a big piece. Um, and then um, again, and then that shared responsibility for re review and revision. Um, Those are great points. That's of, really good. Pushes back into the people going, well, I thought you were supposed to do it. No, that's your job. <laughs> if we play together as a collaborative group, all the fingers should be pointing at ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we what we've been talking about all you know ever since four is is around collaborative governance. So, yeah, we're we're a little bit below, you know, a little down in the weeds on it, but yeah, okay. we're we're definitely talking about collaborative governance right now. Did I miss anyone? Yeah, but I don't have anything more to add than, than what uh, a lot of really smart people in this room have already said. So Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the only thing that I would add is that um, when you're collaborating with folks, it's important to um, give people grace, um, particularly when you're grappling with a tough topic. Um, and, to, you know, when you start feeling yourself getting angry or, or feeling polarized, you know, check yourself and, and try not to question the other person's motives. Uh, it's never, never good. You know, uh, particularly with school boards, we all come to this for the same reason because we want to help kids. We're all, you know, doing this work for the same reason. So, you know, it's important to give each other grace and particularly right now when, I mean, you folks spoke to each other and talked about the things that you were struggling with. You know, this is a hard time. So give yourself some space to maybe say stuff wrong or, you know, or change your mind, give yourself the time, to change your mind. So that, that's what I would add. Um, the last piece on this page is, you know, you have all these things, we agree to do these things and they're, they're all good. And then above all, it says children's education and well-being come first. You know, you know when I get lost um, as a board member, um, I always ask myself, what's right for kids? If I have a really tough question, I don't, you know, you got all these competing interests coming in. I always go back to this idea here is what's right for kids. And so I drew an arrow there because I thought, uh, and above all, well, why don't you just put it above all? Why don't you just open with this page with that and saying children's education and well-being come first. The board will represent the needs and interests of all the children of our district. This is a really powerful statement. Um, this is a value statement. And it's something that I think you, you folks can stand on. Um, so consider just bringing that right up there and putting it front and center. So uh, some tougher part, parts of this document here. Um, so coming back to this idea of what can a, what can a single board member do individually what authority does a single board member have 
you know, and it's really, it's said in this first sentence here, you know, a, a single board member doesn't have any official authority. Um, there's nothing that we can really do. Only when we come together, like you are now, do we have any authority to do anything, you know, any authority to govern. Um, this is another piece, and this goes back to that, that comment I made a little bit earlier about, um, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, you know, you know, behave at all times in a manner that respects positively on the district. I mean, don't don't go out and um, badmouth the decision that the that your board made. Respect the process because, you know, next time uh, you may be, you know, it may may be flipped on you. So. And you get you get your way, and someone else is going to say something bad about its decision you were in the majority on. So it's just, and it just reflects badly on the district, um, and it reflects badly on the board. Uh, you need to be a unified board for the community. That doesn't mean does not mean that you don't get to disagree. It's important that you disagree from time to time. Um, you should, because you're each you know, different people, you have different views. So it's important that you do disagree, but when you do, you do it civilly. And then once the board has made, made a decision, you need to support it. The other note I have here is that, um, you know, you are the cheer, you are the, the cheerleaders for the district. So you definitely want to re have a positive impact or, or, reflect the district in a positive light. In this last one, reinforce with the, with the community the key messages agreed upon by the board. Um, I would also say in partnership with your, um, with your district leadership team as well. Um, you probably have a communication, someone who does communications for you. Um, you know, they're, they're useful to you. So work with your superintendent to get your messaging right so that you're unified and you're clear in your communications, particularly right now with the pandemic and, and um, with all the changes that uh, the state is pushing out or has pushed out, there's a lot of anxiety and confusion among parents all over Oregon. And so it's incumbent on us as board members uh, to help our district teams communicate that information. So that means we need to be conversant on what those talking points are so that we can be clear and those parents can navigate those things. And, you know, that's the issue right now. Next year, it may be something different. So while the board is eager to listen, and so I'm moving down here, let me just scroll up. While the board is eager to listen to its con constituents and staff, each inquiry is to be refer referred to the person who can properly and expeditiously address the issues. So this is where, um, where it looks like you might be deviating from your policies a little bit. And I think I, I, I get into it a little more in more detail, but um, all inquiries should really go through the superintendent. Um, board members should not be contacting members of the staff for information. If you have an information request, you really need to, your superintendent needs to know about that. And there's a couple of reasons. One, your superintendent needs to have situational awareness, needs to know what board members are thinking about. The other is, is that um, if a single board member gets a piece of information, then you have asymmetrical knowledge in the board. So if you, you know, the superintendent needs to make sure that the whole board is informed on a particular issue and that everybody has um, all the information. So, um, so, but this sounds also like, um, this is about uh, the board's role. It's kind of an ombuds role of board members, sometimes parents uh, or members of the community will come to a board member asking for information or talking about a potential complaint or something like that. Um, and so that's what this, you know, this referral piece is. So I, I'm seeing this in kind of two channels. One is information requests and then also that ombuds role. And I'm sure all of you have had this experience where you've had somebody approach you with an issue with the district and you've had to, you probably, hopefully you have referred them saying, not literally in an email to that particular staff person, but you've referred them 
So if they have a complaint, you said, well, you need to go back to the teacher and try to resolve that issue at the lowest possible level if it's a complaint issue, or you might refer them to a particular staff member, but they're the one that's reaching out to the district, not you. Does that make sense? I didn't handle that really well. Are there any questions about that? Because it can be confusing, but you do. I mean, we get pushed into that ombuds role of, of supporting someone in the process. You don't take the steps. You don't lean on your superintendent for a decision. You're just supporting that parent in how they access and interact with the district because you know the policies and you know the procedures much better than other people in the district or in the community. And that's this last piece. Thank them for sharing their thoughts and refer them to the appropriate staff member. If necessary, encourage them to initiate the formal complaint process um, if need be. And you can, and that is something that you can do. You can pull your policy KL, that's the complaint policy, and you can email that to them. But they're the ones that do the work. You're not doing the work. So I really appreciate this one. All personnel complaints and criticisms received by the board and, or its individual members are directed to the superintendent. Absolutely, every time without exception. To do otherwise breaks trust and, and, and respect with your superintendent. You just, you always have to go through your superintendent. And then uh, this is a nice piece here. We were talking about that ombuds role. If you're interacting with someone, particularly in the complaint process, or if you if you are on the leading edge, you know that a complaint, complaint is popping up, it's a good practice to go ahead and let your superintendent know, hey, I talked to this parent. Um, looks like they're gonna they're gonna file a formal complaint. They're at this school. So oftentimes superintendents can move, be real nimble and get out ahead of that and prevent the Canton complaint from actually happening. So, so that's one of the, but always, you know, work in partnership with your superintendent. Any questions about that? Good stuff. So yeah, when individually visiting schools, uh, or departments of is professional and courtesy in their capacity as a board member to be encouraged to notify the superintendent that they will be visiting the school or department. Um, let's go look at your policy BG because I noted it and now I don't remember what I was talking about. Um, and I can't access this policy BG. So formal, and this is that piece where you have formal and official school visits are authorized by the board. So what I'm noting between these two documents is that there's some confusion that it's not, it's just not clear. Um, you, in your policy, you're citing formal and informal uh, visits and it just seems informal in your governance document. So I think I mean, I don't want to belabor the point. I just think you folks need to go back and just take a look at that and make sure that these two documents are lining up and making sure that your, that your governance handbook is, um, is lining up with your policy. Uh, let's see, visits to school, formal and official visits by board members will be authorized by board action, communicated to the superintendent, communicated through the, super, to, through the superintendent to appropriate supervisors and staff. Totally appropriate. Um, informal or Unofficial visits by board members are encouraged. Board members will contact the building administrator or supervisor before informal or unofficial visits. Um, I don't know. I think that's a conversation you can have with your superintendent, how they feel about that. I know that in, in uh, our district, board members typically do not go, just go into any school without letting the superintendent know. So if, if I could jump in for a second. Yeah, guy. Um, this policy was written because we have parents that are on the board that have kids yeah. that a lot have to visit the school, as well as we've got um, Suzanne, who's also volunteers with a lot of programs in the school. We consider those informal visits. Um, we've had a lot of discussion back and forth about this. Um, and, and the board, like the email issue, has been really good about keeping the two separate. 
Now, I, I understand that that might not be the way the rest of the state does it, but it's been kind of working for us. I, I That's my opinion. Somebody else might want to ch chime in a little differently, but that's why you're seeing a difference between those two. So maybe what you need to do is just spell that out a little more clearly in your in your governance document, your governance handbook, and just really make that clear. So just saying if, you know, a board member is a parent or volunteers and just really define what that is. And that's the purpose of, that's the whole point of having, you know, governance handbook or board norms is to really illuminate these policies and make it clear what, what we're trying to do. So no, I, I, I totally understand. I mean, I, my kids go to an elementary school two blocks away from where I'm, where I'm standing right now. And so, yeah, when I, I, I visit that elementary school all the time, but yeah. So let's go back. So board members shall not request any information uh, from staff beyond that, which would be provided to any re regular community members. Um, that should just be information that's readily, readily available to you anyway. I don't know that, that it would be an information request. Um, this, uh, yeah, popped right out for me. Staff members are directed to relay formal requests from board members to the supervisor. Uh, board members should not be making information requests. And let's go look at policy BBAA because I, I think it is out of alignment here. This is it. No, that's BBA, BBAA. Um, any individual who desires a written report or survey prepared by the administrator will make such a request to the superintendent. A copy of such material will be sent to the uh, to each member of the board. So and requests for, for reports and information which require additional expense into the district must be submitted uh, to the board for consideration. So I think that's a that's an example of where where yeah this document's not a, not in alignment and I would say that that's not best practice. So yeah, you shouldn't have an avenue uh, where board members are are going around your superintendent uh, for those reasons that I cited earlier. You know, the superintendent needs to be aware of those. He needs to know what what his board is uh, thinking about, and you know, and board members, you know. You say that it's going to be provided um, to all board. So if, if I could, if I could add in there, so being on the board for as long as I've had, there have been times when board members have not been following the correct correct procedures and had been re requesting information, and so this was seen as a as an additional deterrent for the, for them to. Um, <laughs> to not do it, but I agree it's it's it 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 shouldn't be in there and and I think all our board members know know better by now. So um, yeah, so, Paul, yeah, go ahead, Bob. Uh, Paul, if I may just interject, was that policy written that way originally to prevent putting the staff member on the spot? In other words, prevent the staff member from saying, no, you're not supposed to ask me that question, but uh, instead just direct the staff to report that to their supervisor. Yeah, that was, that was some of it. Yeah. That and board member getting information from friends that worked at the school and then using it in the board and at the superintendent later on without anybody knowing about it. I think I think another concern that was part of that was, you know, if if a board member asks a staff member for something, they're discounting the fact that that there's time and energy involved in all those processes, and we don't want to interrupt the teacher's teaching time or her teaching day or his uh, responsibilities as a teacher in order to do something for the board that may or may not be within the scope of their job. I'd like to offer that we just remove this section, this, you know, this information altogether and just simply state that board, mem board members will request um, information only from the supervisor. I'm sorry, superintendent. 
and leave it at that. You muted, Bob. I I agree with Diana in that uh, from a standpoint that you know we don't tell the staff what to do, and but so putting it in our in our board governance board governance handbook that staff members are supposed to do or not do something, we just tell our board our board members don't ask. If you have a request for information, go to the superintendent, and I'm expecting that the the superintendent and the admin staff would make it clear to their employees what they're supposed to do in that case. Yeah. So, I mean, the way I was talking earlier, it sounded like I was admonishing, you know, and saying that information requests are bad, or and that's not the case. You know, sometimes board members detect pro detect a problem and there's a legitimate need for additional information. And so uh, this last sentence is really important. This problem doesn't imply censoring of any private or informal conversations, but I wanna remind you of that slide. Remember uh, striking the spark in your board, that leadership piece, um, that's, this is part of that. You know, you need to bring your board along if you're gonna, if you're gonna ask for information, you know, maybe you got a problem in your SPED program. It could be anything, um, you know, um, yeah, you just need to bring your board along and you need to let the superintendent know and how, and the superintendent's going to step in and handle that situation. So, uh, sounds like you folks have got a solution for this language. And so I'm not going to belabor it anymore unless we have any more comments. Great. Um, the superintendent with support staff will create each board agenda. So this is, uh, again, uh, looks like you, you're out of alignment here. Um, so the meeting that you're having right now, this is a meeting of the board. It's not a meeting of the superintendent's meeting. So this is, this is the governance body. And in your policy, BDDC, Uh, I think it's uh, the board chair with the assistance of the superintendent will prepare an agenda for all regular meetings of the board. Um, usually the vice chair is going to be there too to, to support that. So yeah, I mean, that's, I'm just going to leave it there. I mean, it's just, yeah, that language is not in alignment. The board chair gets to put the logs on the fire. This is kind of like, uh, imagine if you will, the way this is written, it would be like the director of the CIA setting the agenda for the House Intelligence Committee. It just kind of does, doesn't make sense. As a board, we do it as per policy. Um, and I, I see what you're saying here. I, I think the statement was more meant that we depend on the superintendent and his staff to put that together on paper, but uh, certainly our chair, vice chair, and anybody from the community or the board that wants to add anything to the meeting meet. Um, I know it's a Tuesday morning because I was just doing it yeah. for a while. Um, but yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, and, you have agen agenda yeah. planning meetings. Yep. Yeah, and, and maybe we need to rewrite this a little bit to, to state we do this in accordance with the policy, but yeah. Uh, okay. That's the way I interpret it too. And I think uh, change of the, the verbiage there would be a good idea. I, I'm with Guy. The, I think the intention of that line was that the superintendent and the support staff would actually create the document, not the content. Yeah, some clarity there would be good. Yeah. Oh, back to that concept of no surprises. I think we, we've discussed that enough. And The thing I lifted out of here, board members will make every effort to submit prior to the meeting questions they intend to ask the superintendent, superintendent and district staff. Um, this is that, you know, you want, this is really professional courtesy. You want to give folks enough time to think about something and get, get the information together. Um, it's just the best practice. Um, you know, if you had, and also you can share that, that question with the rest of the board. You can ask them, you know, send it out. It's not deliberation. You're just asking a question of staff. And that, and then the superintendent should respond um, either in the meeting or sometimes you can get the information ahead of the meeting. Um, depends on how much lead time you give them or how hard the information request is. Any board member, uh, 
any board member request of staff, which will take more than 30 minutes to fulfill, um, must be made by a majority of the board so as not to detract. Again, that's that, you know, align with it with policy BBAA. So just you might take a look at this language and go ahead and alignment, align it. Um, I think that's the only only comment there I have. Board members will review information provided to them and and be open to ongoing professional development and training. Uh, so one of the things that you should have is a is a you know you should be setting goals for yourselves. Uh, when was the last time this board did a self assessment? This past year. And did you develop de uh, create development goals uh, coming out of that that assessment? We did, and we had done the year before. We do it every year, and then we evaluate our goals. Then I'm not going to talk about that anymore. So each board member respects the right of other board of other board members to vote in the minority position. If doing so, each board member agrees as a courtesy to the team to explain the reason for their minority vote, either during deliberation or after casting the vote. Um, this is a totally appropriate language. This is great. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone prior to, to casting a vote, it's, you know, when, as you're having, when the chair opens, you know, you get a motion and you have a motion made, it's seconded, chair opens debate or discussion. Um, that's a good time to just say, I'm, you know, I'm gonna vote in favor of this or against this for these reasons. That's just a totally appropriate time to do that. Um, and probably should happen before the vote. And that's important because you're filling in, you know, you are a team with different points of view. And so you're filling in that experience. You're working as a team by sharing your opinion uh, or your understanding or the, your understanding of the dimensions of the issue or the, or the motion before uh, the board at that moment. So it's just good to have that discussion and, and let folks know, you know, I'm going to vote in favor or I'm, I'm leaning voting in favor. Or you can say, I have no idea how to vote and I want to hear a lot of discussion around this because I'm really confused or this is a hard topic for me for whatever reason. So it's good to uh, share your process and your thinking with your fellow board members. Um, any questions about that? Comments? I would just submit that uh, it's very difficult to talk about if you if you think you're in the minority on something or or you're going against the popular uh, the popular opinions, it's difficult to talk about that. But it's really imperative to do that. If if I go into a a meeting and hear the report and we have a little discussion and I'm against it. Uh, I'd like to think that I would have the strength of the, the courage of my convictions to say, hey, I'm voting against this because X uh, and maybe my argument would be compelling enough to cause somebody else to, to think the same way. Uh, it's just it's part of that collaboration piece. Yeah, I want to I want to jump in on there, too. I think that that's really important because oftentimes a dissenting opinion that might not have been heard in the discussion for whatever reason, you know, is a really important point. And so knowing that information makes the decision more solid for everyone, or at least a fuller consideration of issues. Other thoughts? So this is a, one of those situations where if you're in the majority, it's, it's important to give um, your fellow board members the grace to have a different opinion. Um, hey, hey, Vince? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add, and, you know, I, and I actually think that dissenting minority votes are, are a good thing, too, because it, it shows the community that people are actually thinking about it and it's not just you know rubber stamping everything that comes through so i think you know having that that uh, 
dissension at times or the the you know is is a good thing i i there is one change i would like you to consider and that i think that the the that the the best time to explain the reason for the minority vote is during deliberation that's when we need to hear it we we don't want to hear it after casting the vote and i think that puts you know, that places the board member in a difficult position um, after casting a vote. I really think we really need to, to just emphasize within this document that that explanation, if offered, needs to come during deliberation. I, I, I agree it should, but um, I also agree that, that if they, those, if the, the person doesn't offer and an, a reason it's it should be um, something should be said at least so it sounds like you, you may have some more discussion about this but um any other thoughts you know, being in disagreement is always hard um, and goodness knows right now, uh, we need uh, government officials to be being as civil as we can be. I mean, you are setting an example for your community on what uh, acceptable public discourse looks like. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that you chose to have this in your in your documents and that you're willing to have this conversation around it and that you're willing to embrace that disagreement. So this next one, if a member of the governance team cannot support a decision of the board because it offends a moral or personal code, uh, the member is expected at a minimum to refrain from undermining the decision or directive. However, the decision of the board shall be considered final. So why is this important? Well, it's important from the standpoint of uh, efficiency. I mean, if you have a discussion, staff presents something to you, you talk about it, you ask questions, and you make a decision, uh, you can't have somebody bringing it up again the next month and saying, hey, I want to talk about this again. We've made the decision, let's move on. It's also from the standpoint of presenting a, a, uh, a good image to the public that once we make a decision, unless there's some overwhelming evidence to the contrary, that we stand by it. And we, we're not a divided, we're a team. And uh, we all, even though one or two of us may have felt personally opposed to it, once the majority has made the decision, we move on and we implement that decision and make, try to make it the best it is. Yeah, I think it gets back to that whole concept of collaborative. Collaborative means, you know, that you put, everybody gives their input and then you make a decision. And if it's a majority of the board that decides it, then that's collaborative decision-making and that's what we're about. Other thoughts? Yeah, it's our role of governance. So we've chosen to do this. Our job here is to act as a board to govern and guide this school district in the direction that our community members that elected us wanted us to go. And we're not always gonna agree, but at the end of the day, our job is to govern in the school. And we can't do that if somebody's constantly trying to undermine the board or multiple people are trying to undermine the board. So once a decision's made, you either need to support it or be quiet about it. You're certainly welcome to have um, your opinions. You're certainly welcome to say, you know, I, I didn't agree with it, but it's the board's decision and we're moving on and that's what's, that's what's gonna happen. Um, but it yeah. is, it okay. is our choice. It's okay, it's our choice of how we govern in this country and it's the agreement we've made with our public. Sorry, go ahead. No, I apologize for interrupting. 
Um, I was just going to ask, have we defined governance team in this document? I mean, if we're really talking about board members undermining other board members or the decision of the board, then shouldn't that say that? If not, what is what are we saying the governance team? Is that our administrative staff and the board? No, I, I believe in this instance, we're talking about the board itself is the governance team and you do bring up a good point. Yeah, that might be something you want to take up. You know, Guy, I really appreciate you, your coming. You kind of stole the words right out of my mouth. You know, it's something that I feel pretty strongly about. I take governance pretty seriously, uh, but I think you you said it really well. But, you know, this is the this is what democracy <laughs> this is what democracy looks like, and we have to be able to come together as a as a leadership um, as a community community leaders, um, and govern in a civil way. And if we can't do that, then we're in trouble. So I really appreciated the comments of the board uh, on this question. Um, I just have a smiley face here. Um, I didn't put it in on this document, but I just really appreciated that you laid out the board's role in collective bargaining. I, I didn't have anything to add or, or any problems with it. It's just, I hadn't seen it before. And I just thought that was really nice to have laid out because uh, you know this isn't this isn't just for you this is also for the public and it helps them understand what the role of the board is looks like we're all the way down here so um all conflicts between the superintendent and the board will be handled in executive session uh with the superintendent being in attendance when appropriate and necessary uh, conflicts between individual board members and or the superintendent will be addressed privately between those who hold hold the conflict and will not involve other members of the board or public. Um, I would just say with the caveat um, under ORS 192.660 I, you know, where you're meeting with, uh, you know, members of the staff. Uh, whoever, you know, in this case, the superintendent, if they choose to have a public hearing, they can. So uh, again, I wanna step back and say, why is this important? So I th think it was probably, you know, set up that way to try to, save face for the district to keep stuff, you know, between the board and, and the superintendent. But, you know, the, like you said, the ORS rule is, is that it can be in, in public if it, um, if the superintendent so chooses. Yeah, I, I mean, the, I wasn't talking about the ORS. I mean, that, that is here near there, but why, you know, why is it important that we were able to meet in private and have these why is this important? Because we all don't don't agree all the time, and there's different. Everybody's an individual person, and and so having having to to be able to work as a team, you have to understand each other. You have to be able to speak frankly, and it's hard to speak frankly in public. Yep. And it's important for us, while in public, to appear to be 100% supportive of our goal and goal focused. And um, if we're deliberating in public, then we certainly um, may not appear to be 100% be um, together on any particular goal or direction. Well, and not only that, but like conflicts between the individual board members or a board member of the superintendent, there's the best uh, way to resolve those sorts of things is sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, you know, maybe a third party to mediate or to, to be there and, and help walk through it. But you can nip something in the bud this way. Because uh, sometimes they're just a misunderstanding. Uh, you know, he said, she said, or he said, he said. Um, and you know, it can spiral out of control really quick. So the best thing is just stop get together, say, okay, I didn't realize this hurt your feelings, or okay, I didn't understand this, or all right, I, I misheard you. So 
that's just the best way to resolve it. I think, I think another component of this is just individual power. You know, we talked at the very beginning about how no single board member has a lot of authority. And if you have board members vying for one another or arguing publicly in a public meeting, which our board meetings are, then it sets up this, um, this sense that there's power and control that's being grappled for amongst the board. And that's just not what we want to reflect to our community, <clears throat> nor is it really the way we want to do what's in the best interest of the children. You know, we want to work through things. We don't want to grapple about them and we don't want to try and develop camps where, well, we agree with this board member and we agree with that board member because it's all just too divisive. I don't, any other thoughts there? I don't think I have anything to add. I think uh, the board said everything that needed to be said here. It's really just about, it's about trust. You want to conserve trust. Trust is the currency that allows you to, allows you to govern effectively. So um, yeah, well said. Um, uh, board commits a complete annual evaluation. You have a bunch of language here. Um, I'm going to transition here and, and talk about, um, you know, the superintendent and the new superintendent evaluation process that was developed between COSA and, and OSBA here in just a little bit. Um, if you choose to take that path, you may, you may want to uh, revise this language as needed just to make sure it's, it's aligned. Um, and then the, the last thing that I had here was another smiley face down here. Uh, just saying that within 90 days of election or appointment, new board members are going to get trained and skilled up and, and be supported. So uh, just, you know, I, I enjoyed reading this document and going through it. It's a very pragmatic document. Um, I like the approachable language that's used in it. Um, I think it's a really good, it's a really good document. Um, and then there's a couple things that I think I'm gonna borrow for, for my board. It's one of the, the benefits of being a board member and working for OSBA is I get to pick all the best practices from all over the state. So um, I know that our time, we're getting a little late here. So I just wanna transition. I only have a couple more slides that I need to go through here. Um, We'll have a, just a real quick uh, conversation here. And then um, I'll let you go. We can, those of us who haven't eaten can have dinner and we'll get on with our evenings. Um, so like I said, uh, OSBA and COSA work together to develop a, a superintendent evaluation tool. Um, and I'm really excited to use it. Um, uh, the Corvallis School Board is using this document um, and no one has completed a year with it, so it's all brand new. But I just want to step back and um, I want you to think of a time when you received feedback or an evaluation uh, that was a positive, positive experience. And, you know, what was it that made that a positive experience? What did you do and what did the other do, person do? To make it a positive experience and I'm going to set a timer for a minute and a half and uh, just go ahead and jot down your thoughts uh, real quick and then we'll come right back and have some responses. Hey, Chair, excuse me for just a minute. Somebody's knocking at my door. I'll be right back.
It's about 30 seconds remaining. All right, maybe we won't go around the whole board here, but um, maybe some just uh, some thoughts here. You know, think of a time when you had an evaluation. What what made that experience positive? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, the the thing that I've always appreciated when I was evaluated is feeling like the person that was doing the evaluation really knew what I was doing that they had actually attended to my goals and my style and you know, were paying attention to what I wanted to accomplish. And then I think evaluations are more satisfying when they give you some, some challenge, you know, something that you could do better, something that you could work on. Because otherwise you feel, you feel like there's a pat on the back, but you, you don't feel like there's really teeth to it unless there's, well, what else can I do better? Because all of us want to always do better. So that's what I think. Thanks for that, Suzanne. Yeah, definitely tailored responses based on your needs. And then, yeah, again, room to grow. That's important. Definitely. Other thoughts? Well, I'll well, add on to that if that's all right. Um, in terms of positive experience, I think the you know, the best performance reviews include some examples, um, specific examples of, of how you've impacted, what impacts you've made um, within a course of time or a period of time. Um, I think that those are most meaningful because as Suzanne um, stated, it really shows that there were thought behind them, there was awareness and, um, and an interest in the activities that you're doing. Um, in terms of what the other person might do to make a positive experience, um, I'll always appreciate it when your supervisor or the person that's providing with it, you with your evaluation asks you what they may do to improve their performance and how they can facilitate your performance better over the course of a year. Great response. I really like that, that the evaluation is a conversation of mutual continuous improvement. And um, yeah, also that that having examples, you know, the evidence, what is the evidence of, of your performance or what are the artifacts that you use? And you're going to hear, hear more about that in just a little bit. And maybe one other person, because so I know our time our time's getting late. Paul here. I think an important part that you know helps when that I think is a positive is that they they actually spent the time that they were prepared uh, when they did the evaluation that it wasn't just something uh, thrown together. Absolutely, Paul. Yeah, process process matters, and that the process was followed uh, with fidelity, and that it's that's a well thought out process that's effective. So no, I, I totally agree. So thank you for those responses. Um, so the behavior that is modeled by the leader and management profoundly shapes the culture and practices of the organization. This again, hearkening back to that, that first slide that I showed you that what you do matters um, and that uh, what you're doing by uh, evaluating the superintendent in a comprehensive way, in a way that is a very thoughtful process, um, that has artifacts and proof of improvement, um, <laughs> that provides the goals for admin your administrator's growth um, and tailored to your administrator's needs. All of that is really what you're doing is you're communicating a culture of continuous improvement. Um, and that's something that, that we all need. Anything that you do can be shot through this focus framework. 
So in here, we're talking about evaluating the superintendent and I've, I have some text in here, but it's just a suggestion. It's not, you're gonna need to go through the process of, of, of thinking through this, but you know, setting clear expectations, you know, um, having a f effective leadership that results in, in, in graduates prepared for their next steps in life. I mean, that's what we're working towards, right? Um, you know, learning together you know, what makes a, a good evaluation? Uh, which goals should you adopt? What information is the, is the board going to need to evaluate the superintendent? Um, you know, those conditions for success, you know, having superintendent goals, following an eva evaluation plan, you're meeting regularly to have those check-ins um, with your superintendent. You know, holding the superintendent accountant, having clear definition of who and what, what is the Sayusla School District. What is your vision for yourselves? Where are you going? What is that island of student success paradise that you are asking the, the superintendent to steer the ship towards? And then, you know, communicating that because the, the superintendent evaluation is one of the areas where the board gets to celebrate the success of the superintendent. So, um, Focus framework, it, it applies to everything that you do. So it's a, it's a valuable tool. So this is uh, where you're at right now. Uh, you are in the pre-evaluation planning process for this year. Um, typically this starts earlier, um, you know, usually in April. So you should be wrapping up your evaluation. And I believe by policy, you're wrapping up in March. And also based on, well, I have your, um, some language from your uh, superintendent's contract. The next step is you're going to be having check-in meetings. You, uh, we recommend that you have uh, have them quarterly, so you're going to have three check-in meetings over the school over the school year. Um, then you're going to go into this process. This is around January, so you know December, January. You're going to be gathering information, uh, the, those artifacts, those examples. You're going to be gathering data. Um, if you're going to be doing a, a survey. Uh, in association with the superintendent evaluation, this is the time when that, that happens. Um, you compile those results. This is probably February uh, when you bring that all together. And this is work that the board is going to do. This is when you're gonna be looking at the standards and scoring them. And you're gonna see the, that information here in just a little bit. And I'm gonna send you these sli this slide deck. So, you know, you I see that some people are taking notes, but you know, you're going to get all of this. And then you conclude it um, in March where you're going to go ahead and have that meeting, that final uh, evaluation meeting with the superintendent. And then um, the board chair gets the, the task of creating the summary that's shared with the public. But first things first, we have to talk about policy. So this is your policy CBG, so evaluation of the superintendent. Uh, and you state it's evaluated formally, at least annually. And goals for the year established by the superintendent and or the board. And so those should be done, that should be done collaboratively when you're making those goals. Um, this is your policy CBA. Uh, this is, you know, qualifications. This is what your superintendent does for you. States, you know, right there front and center, the, the he reports to the board of directors. That's why he gives you the authority to do this evaluation. Contract, you should know what's in your superintendent's contract. This is really falls to your board leadership team to keep a close eye on this. Um, and this is from your superintendent's contract because your board secretary shared it with me and I was able to look at it, but the board directors shall prior to March 15th of each year conduct an evaluation. So you have to, it is in his contract that you are gonna evaluate him by March 15th. If you go off after March 15th, that you're in breach of contract. Performance goals, the uh, board and superintendent shall meet as annually to establish district goals and objectives for the ensuing year. Um, these goals and uh, reduced in writing shall be among the criteria for which the superintendent is evaluated. I really, really appreciate this. This is something that I, you know, the board is responsible for oversight of the district or in tracking progress. Um, and while, and we're gonna talk about the difference between goals, but 
I personally really like the idea of connecting superintendent evaluation to performance of the district. But keep in mind that these are goals. When you craft these goals with your superintendent, these are professional goals for your superintendent. And that district goals are separate from superintendent goals. But nevertheless, I think, you know, that an administ administrator's performance should be tied to, to the organization's performance, at least in some respect. And so I appreciated this in the, having it right in the superintendent's contract. It's very courageous on, on the part of your superintendent to have had this in, in, his, in his contract. So you need a plan. Um, this is a fairly, there's a lot of moving parts to a, a superintendent evaluation process. Um, so things you need to consider are, you know, you know, what are you gonna evaluate? What performance standards and what, what are the goals? Um, are you gonna use a targeted feedback survey? Um, so you've probably heard of 360 surveys where you just survey everybody and they talk about the superintendent. Targeted feedback survey is somewhat different. Uh, it's targeted to uh, specific stakeholders, both within the, the organization and also uh, community stakeholders as well. Um, often those people, well, I'm gonna talk about it here in just a little bit, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and then you need to think about what order artifacts are you going to have to, to have evidence of uh, the superintendent's performance. So there's going to be a superintendent's written self-evaluation, and then the superintendent is going to need to produce some proof to validate that information. Um, you're going to need to consider goals. What, uh, what issues require the leadership of the superintendent? That's going to be part of your goals. What changes do you want to see in the coming year? Um, you know, <laughs> you know, we say tongue in cheek, you know, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We just want to survive. We just want to educate kids the best we can. Um, and it's, you know, it's important that we have reasonable expectations based, you know, operationally. You know, but we need to think about, you know, as we're thinking about next year, the changes we want to see or what improvements we'd like to see or just, you know, at least maintaining status quo, what's the superintendent role in leading those changes? How do you measure that, that progress? And how, how does the board want to receive that information? So how do you want the superintendent to report on that? So this is what the timeline looks like. So typically you start in, um, so evaluation happens in March. Um, so typically you set goals in April. So you're a little bit behind, behind unless you have superintendent goals. Did you establish superintendent goals? Do we know that? Yes, we have superintendent goals established. Right. So then, so then you're right on time. Um, so then you'll you'll be having check-in meetings, or should be having check-in meetings throughout the year, um, and then you'll go through that process of gathering information. Um, you know, from October, November, December, and then in pre-evaluation, uh, you're gonna be, that's January and February, where you're pulling that, synthesizing the information to, for delivery in late February, early March, to meet your March 15th deadline. So you are, it is the board's uh, job to adopt the evaluation standards and the process uh, by which you're gonna do that. So that's something that if you haven't done it already, that's something that you'll need to, to bring onto an agenda. There in the document, there's a number of performance standards and this should be fairly familiar because in the um, COSA's, um, you used COSA's evaluation tool uh, previously, is that correct? We used OSBAs. Okay, then yeah. so this this is not too much of a departure. You know, the, the, there was a scoring system where you give a numerical value and that's been retained. Um, so you'll be scoring on, on, ver on various performance standards. These are those standards. So visionary district leadership, ethics and professional norms, inclusive district culture, culturally responsive instructional leadership and improvement, 
communication and community relations, effective organizational management, effective financial, our financial management, and then policy governance and advocacy. And there are indicators within each of these um, that are in the document. Um, and I believe that that was given to you by the board secretary. So you, you can go through that and see what those indicators are on each of these standards. Um, it's once you get into the booklet, it's pretty self-explanatory. I wish I could claim that I helped build the document, but I, I didn't. I came on right as they were finishing it up. Um, so yeah, goals are important. I mean, this is this is part of that growth piece, you know. So your superintendent is going to need to craft goals and get and um, develop them in collaboration with the board, and you'll be approving those. So district goals are, you know, this is the overarching, overarching goal. Oh, wait, how did that happen? So overarching goals, you know, you determine them collaboratively uh, with your staff. Um, they identify strat strategies and actions. So it's really things that are happening uh, below the board level. This is in the action area, execution, not in the governance area. They, um, they're going to have indicate measures for monitoring progress, of course, include timelines, and they are board adopted. So your district, I'm sure your district has goals. Superintendent goals are something different. I don't know why my slides are advancing on their own, but identified collaboratively by the superintendent and the board. So you do this together. They're tied to the attainment of district goals. So they're connected. Um, but they're not the same thing necessarily. Um, and again, indicate measures for progress. And of course they're time bound and they are approved by the board. So this is the, the evidence piece that Diana was talking about. Um, you know, how is the board gonna measure progress? What tools? And there is a nice list in the back of the um, evaluation workbook that gives a list of potential artifacts or items that the board can use or to uh, or the superintendent can provide to the board as evidence of progress or growth it is not it does not mean that the superintendent needs to provide all of those things you need to choose two or three items you know per goal area to validate that you don't want to over encumber your your superintendent um, providing it, you're just going to look for those high level indicators or in, or some sort of evidence of, you know, so if community engagement is a priority for you, you then you're going to want to have evidence that the superintendent was getting out and engaging the community, you know, either in person or right now electronically. Um, maybe there's academic um, goals. So those are all evidences that you'll need in your evaluation process. So that I alluded to this, it's on in appendix C in the document on page 25, you can flip to that if you have the document in front of you, um, but it's a pretty comprehensive list. It's very nice, it's a good, it gives you a running start for choosing what those items might be to give you evidence of, of growth. Back to that targeted feedback survey, I already told you that it's um, it's not a broadcast survey. You choose, you pick who you're going to hear from. You know, it provides the superintendent and the board with additional insight and information. Um, it values uh, stakeholder input um, measures. It measures behaviors and competencies around um, subject areas that are relevant to uh, the superintendent like teamwork and character, leadership, uh, their effectiveness and the, how they work, gets feedback on how others are perceiving the superintendent um, as they execute skills such as, you know, listening or planning or goal setting. Um, some of the disadvantages of using a survey is that it's a survey and it has to be very carefully crafted. Um, and it can be misused as a, a backdoor to the complaint process or a grievance procedure. Um, I think one of the most important things is that a targeted feedback survey can't be the whole evaluation. It is just one component. It's one piece of information that the board needs to consider. Um, and 
Um, you know, sometimes, or people that are responding to the survey, it's they're self-selecting. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that it's, it's fairly subjective. It's not necessarily an objective measure. So it needs to be understood in context. So your, your board should have uh, a calendar, something like this with each month and things that you need to get done. Your, your uh, superintendent evaluation should be plotted out in your annual calendar. So the board knows what it's doing as it goes forward. Um, like I said, March 15th is your deadline for, for wrapping up the ev uh, evaluation. So quarterly check-ins, uh, these are really important. Um, and when we think about that, we, we talk about the three C's. Um, there's three things that you're gonna do. One, celebrating the success of the superintendent where there are gonna be things that are going really well. Um, then there's calibration. You know, if something is, if there's, you just need some adjustment, something that's just slightly, there's a misunderstanding, this is a good time to check in and make sure that, you know, maybe it's in your working agreement with your superintendent. Maybe it's in your governance uh, handbook so that there's some misunderstanding. And if there's something that's wrong, um, you know, things are really getting sideways, then you can go ahead and course correct um, in, these, in these interactions. So um, you guys have incorporated your board superintendent working agreement into your governance handbook. So uh, this is a good time uh, to go back and Take a look at that document, um, you know, a couple times or three times a year, because the board and the superintendent are like um, a pitcher and a catcher on the on a on a baseball team. So the superintendent is the catcher. Um, they're and they're trying to get you know. You'll see that the catcher tries to give signals to the board to give them the pitch that they need. And except in this baseball game that the students are the batter and we want them to hit a home run every time. So it's a very close relationship. And so it's important that we have these check-ins. So this is just an um, overview of what we've talked about. Um, you know, you're gonna be using your own, the board's direct knowledge from your uh, interactions with the superintendent um, in scoring the, uh, the standards. You're gonna use um, the superintendent self-evaluation and those artifacts and evidence of, of uh, his performance. And then if you so choose, you're gonna have that, you can have that targeted feedback survey um, to support your, your superintendent evaluation. And the board chair gets to synthesize all this into a summary. And there's an example in the document that give you a running start on that, but, and that's going to, this summary gets shared with the public, as you know, because you've done this many, many times. And so, um, but I want to say, don't forget that, again, and we've said this a few times in, the, in our time together, that there shouldn't be any surprises here, um, that the evaluation process uh, should promote individual growth and strengthen the relationship between the board and the superintendent. So this is what the cover looks like. And I just want to return back to this slide, which is, you know, the superintendent evaluation is all about setting clear expect expectations. And that starts with setting goals and doing that collaboratively together. And you've already done that. And it sounds like uh, the board is um, seeking to do some goal setting, but I think we've, uh, we've run out of time tonight. So into my slide deck, uh, coming back to kids, I like putting my kids on, on my slides because this is what it's all about, is about um, educating our kiddos and building a future for them. So I'm gonna stop my share and pause for questions or reflections. I've only used up almost all of my three hours. Yeah, Suzanne, you are muted. Yeah, there. Uh, yeah, when we were talking about the board, board evaluation, you know, we spent quite a bit of time 
thinking about um, our, our gathering of information other than just from the board. And um, I know you mentioned the target of surveys. Can you give us any examples of what maybe other districts do in terms of, of um, a broader reflection or broader um, um, amount of input from community or staff? Well, the targeted oh. feedback survey is really effective at getting input from the community because you can, you know, those stakeholders in your community that are engaging the district on a on an ongoing basis. So, you know, when we when we deploy those targeted feedback surveys, we we work with the board to identify who that would be, superintendent as well, uh, because he wants to know uh, that unvarnished truth too. Because mm -hmm. he can't grow as a professional if he doesn't know that, so Vince. that's that's how we go about doing that and getting that getting that stakeholder input. Does does that answer your question? Well, I think it helps. And then the other thing we had talked about, um, you know, it's really the whole board that is uh, evaluating the superintendent. And there was a question about whether it should be it, the way we've done it in the past is the board chair uh, and vice chair sit down with the superintendent and deliver the um, summary of the evaluation. And there was a question about maybe that should be done as a whole board, you know, instead of just those two representatives. Have you thought, have you thought either way on that? Yeah, I mean, it's really up to the board on how to handle that. Um, there is no, you know, right or perfect or the best way. It's going to be, you know, it's a very human process and it needs to be calibrated to the individuals that are involved. Uh, I can to reflect what we do in Corvallis. Uh, we, uh, we meet as a leadership team. Uh, we have the superintendent. He comes and provides the evidence. Um, and then we actually go board member by board member and talk and go through the standards and talk about um, the rationale for why we scored each. Um, we have a good relationship with our superintendent. Um, and so we're able to have that. Um, but if there's tension between the board and the superintendent, um, then I think a scenario like what you were talking about uh, may be more appropriate. You know, if people don't feel safe uh, being uh, transparent, you know, face to face, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, the parties involved need to share the information that is going to, you know, help you all grow together as a team. And so if, you know, you can't have those conversations yet, then, uh, you know, you need to have, you need to get that information shared one way or another. And maybe, you know, over time you can build that trust and get into a good place. But um, it really is up to you and your relationship with your administrator on how to go about that. Thank you. Vince, do you have examples that you could share with us of your targeted feedback survey, some that you've used? I'm sure that we do. So I'm gonna I'm helpful. gonna start I'm gonna start with example TFB. Or TFS, targeted feedback survey. Yes. My to-dos that I and I need to send you a slide deck. And I'm gonna send you the focus framework. So those are three to-dos for me. I have a question, if I may. This yeah. is Bonnie, okay. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to clarify the check-ins are an executive session if the superintendent wants those in executive session? Yes, okay. Typically. Okay, typically. I want to check on that. And then I just wanted to say that typically we insert, we do superintendent board goals, they're combined. Mm -hmm. And um, typically in the past, we have just taken those goals and inserted them in the OSBA goals section. So, but reading this, it looks like we should probably pick out 
specific goals for the superintendent? Is that what everybody is understanding or am I off base? So what I have seen done in the, in the short time that I've been with OSBA and the, the sessions that I've been, I've talked about superintendent evaluation, what I've seen is that the superintendent comes to the board with a suite of, of goals. So this is something that Andrew would bring to the board. This is what I want to work on. This is where I think we need to head as an organization. This is where I want to go as a professional and vets that with the, with the board. And then the board gets to have that conversation with the superintendent and calibrate those, those goals. So that's the way I've seen it done. Um, but understand that superintendent goals are not district goals. Um, superintendent goals are, are for the professional, district goals are for the organization. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah, that's, and that said, I really like the idea. And I know in Corvallis, we, we definitely have we tie superintendent performance to the to district performance. We do that explicitly. And that was, you know, our superintendent chose to do that. He, yeah, he wants that. And it's, that creates a lot of structure um, and, and vertical alignment between uh, board goals and then superintendent goals, district goals, all the way down. Um, if, if you're using the same goals, then it, it creates a lot of vertical alignment and it'll creates focus. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So it sounds like, um, you know, Bob, it sounded like you wanted to do some goal setting. We're at 644, so I don't, I don't think that we, we're going to be able to do that in, a, in any robust way. Is that something that you would like me to come back and, or maybe that's something the board wants to discuss, and, or maybe that's something we can discuss offline. Um, I'd be happy to support the board in uh, goal setting. Uh, yeah, that's, let's, let's pull the, pull the directors and do we want to handle goal setting at our September meeting? Are you talking about district goals or superintendent goals, Bob? Well, I, I probably both. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, Andy could bring us his goals for the district and we could work that way. I, I don't know if we want to differ from what we've done in the past, continue to do the combined goals or do what Vince has suggested and, and split those up. I, either way, they're going to be interrelated. I would appreciate that we bring them back to September and give Andy an opportunity to review those goals, determine if, if, if he would suggest changes, uh, modification to the goals, and then the same with the rest of the rest of the team. Just take a look at what we have and then bring, bring, bring it together and, and um, talk about it. Anybody else? I'll second that idea. Yeah, I like that idea too. Okay. Yep. All right. I'm looking at the calendar. Our our September meeting is set for the third Wednesday, the sixteenth. So, Andy, is that reasonable to have you bring your goals for the district to us to as a starting point by the sixteenth? I think I can do that. So yeah. Do you need more time? I mean, and we are we are approaching the beginning of the school year, and you guys are trying to pull something together. Do you need additional time? That is uh, right after school starts. Well, again, I think I could. No, I can have the. Again, this would be a two meeting cycle, or maybe um, the September meeting and a late September meeting. Uh, to do this, but no, I, I, mean, I can have the draft prepared by the 16th. That's, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. I have to apologize. The dog found a squeaking carrot. <laughs> <laughs> All virtual meetings. So what I'm hearing is that on um, September 16th, having a meeting to 
discuss superintendent goals yeah and district goals yeah uh, and vince let's talk offline uh about your involvement in that so yeah i mean we can go either way yeah i'm happy to be there and support you or if you feel that you can do that on your own i i just want to and this is i just want to say um I've seen quite a few boards in the in the few months that I've been working for OSB, OSBA, and I just want to say you're a very strong board, um, very thoughtful, um, very very knowledgeable board. Um, and I don't say it lightly. I would be more than happy to have my kids go to school in your district. Um, you, you folks are doing good work, so thank, thank you, you for for leaning into this process. Um, and being frank and uh, transparent in your responses. Um, so it's been a real pleasure. I've learned a lot myself, um, and I'm definitely taking some good stuff with me from having going and gone through your governance document. So I really appreciate the time. Um, so, uh, Bob, you and I can connect, um, yeah. maybe we can bring, uh, Andy into the conversation and talk about how we want, want that meeting to proceed. Yeah. As, as far as the school board goes, I think you just paid us the ultimate compliment. Uh, I don't do it lightly. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to, there we go. I'm trying to change my view so I could see everybody. Uh, so Vince, thank you very much. Is there, keeping in mind, we're not deliberating or coming to any decisions, but uh, feedback, instant feedback or quick feedback every is there anything else that we need to discuss or, or cover tonight? We're coming up on the three hour mark. Well, just very quickly, you know, um, something that we had talked about before that we set this meeting up was that last year we got off on our process because we kind of started late and then we delayed. And so we were a little bit behind the eight ball when it actually came to the evaluation. So. Right. I would just hope that we would be proactive and try and get things in a really good form so that in January, we're actually ready to look at, at the evaluation. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think we'll probably have a decision on what form we go. I really like the uh, targeted feedback system. Uh, and that's kind of what we were leaning at at the end last time too. So, and I'm sure we can come up with a good list of community members and, and I'm sure that we can find a, uh, a neutral person to actually conduct that survey. So, yeah. OSBA can deploy that survey for you. Okay. All right. All right. Is that it? We're I just all... want to, yeah, just say thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Vince. It was a great meeting, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Diana, I'm really, really glad that you were able to join us uh, to make us a whole group tonight. Thank you very much. You too, John. <laughs> and Dennis and Guy and Paul and Suzanne. Okay, I've covered everybody. Thank, thanks, Vince. Yeah, thank you, Vince. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you all. Good night. So do you need a motion to adjourn or something, Bob? Oh, know. okay. Let's make that happen. I, I'm oh. sorry. I have to point one thing out that I think we missed, and I'm so sorry I didn't notice it before. We didn't approve the agenda. Oh. <laughs> it's a little behind now, but I don't know how to. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but yeah. Uh, let's see. How does it start out? I recommend. I move. I move that the. Um, that the Sayusla School District Board of Directors retroactively approve the agenda for August 26, 2020, and move for dismissal. Okay. All right. <laughs> Is there a second there? Yeah, sorry. One motion at a time and remove the word retroactively, and I'll second it. Yeah. I, I was wondering about the two, two separate issues. Uh, Suzanne, would you mind amending your motion to, to approve the agenda? Um, Mr. Chair, be it yeah. resolved that the Sayusa School District Board of Directors approve the agenda for August 26, 2020. Resolution so number something. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, motion been made to approve the agenda, and it was uh, uh, seconded by Director Rosenbaum. Uh, any discussion on that motion? On all those, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Uh, motion carries unanimous. Now uh, the chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, John Barnett speaks. He moved for adjournment. Is there a second? Second, Diana. By Director Pimlott and uh, by uh, the the right of the chair, we are adjourned. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good, night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks again, Vince. Thank you. Bye bye.